Welcome to the Jack Cornfield Heart Wisdom Hour. We are delighted to share with you Jack's innate common sense wisdom and his clear open heart. If you are interested in supporting Jack's podcast, go to BeHereNowNetwork.com slash Jack. And tonight I'd like to talk about mudita, which is a Sanskrit word for joy and happiness and joy in the happiness of oneself and others. Um, Partly because I had to give a couple of talks about it recently for a benefit and another thing here. And and I sort of got, you know, inspired a little bit to talk about it. Um, And some of the stories I'll use, those of you who've been here before will have heard some of these. So you can consider them like bedtime stories that, you know, oh, I want to hear that one again. (laughs) Right? When I was eight years old, I was um, put into the hospital in St. Louis in this great big old um, (coughs) hospital at St. Louis University Medical School where my father was teaching um, uh, for polio. I was paralyzed, couldn't move much, and had a high fever. And um, it was really scary. It was scary being in this kind of hospital that was wooden and creaky and dark at night and, you know, it's really scary not being able to move. Um, and then they did um, spinal taps with this huge horse needle, you know, and no anesthesia. And I mean, it was, it was, but anyway, for whatever great <laughs> karma, a good blessing that I had, I got better. And after some weeks I could move again. And I remember getting out of the hospital and going back home, and near where we lived on, there was a little corner store, and I bought one of those balsa wood airplanes, the kind that you can throw and that floats, you know. I got one of those, and I went to this little park that was just down the block, and I rolled around on the grass like some dog or something (laughs) like that, and danced and jumped. I was so happy just to be able to walk, just to be able to run, just to be able to move. Um, so, and to be out of that hospital, of course. And, okay, this week, a few days ago, when Aung San Suu Kyi was released from 17 years of house arrest, I felt that kind of happiness for her, you know. And what's extraordinary is the dignity, Grace, beauty, uh, you know, if you watch the videos, there was a BBC interview with her and things like that, not just all the crowds, but her. She came out, like Nelson Mandela came out, with this incredible graciousness and, and um, good heart and clarity of mind, like she'd been on a retreat, which she had been <laughs> way too long, you know. Her teacher is um, Upandita Sayadaw, who's also a teacher that I've studied with, but um, I just felt so happy that she was released. And she seemed incredibly joyful about it, but also incredibly present, using it in some amazing way. Most of my teachers, not all of them, I had some grouchy teachers too, but primarily my teachers were actually very happy and joyful. I think of Gosananda, who was the um, Gandhi of Cambodia, and there's that painting that some of you may have seen in the bookstore in the far corner of the Dalai Lama and Gosananda when they were here together, bowing to each other. And they knew each other over a number of years. As, and the Gosananda was nominated for the Nobel Peace Prize a number of times and leading these loving-kindness marches through the war zones of Cambodia for years and years. And, and so when the Dalai Lama got out of his limousine and Gosananda was there to greet them, he and they started to bow, and each one was trying to bow lower than the other and find their heads touched just about, you know, and they were leveled to the ground. And um, my daughter called him Butterball, actually, because he was this sort of bright orange-robed <laughs> being. And I remember he was at a conference at Gethsemane Abbey, uh, Thomas Merton's place, with the Dalai Lama and a number of other Christian and Buddhist contemplatives, and Brother David Stendelrass, another great Christian meditator, monk, came back and said, who is this orange-road monk who 
upstage the Dalai Lama. And I said, well, how did he upstage the Dalai Lama? He said, he just beamed happiness. Uh, oh, that's Gosananda. That's okay. That's him, you know. Or um, Anagarika Manindra, a teacher in India that I studied with, who was really joyful. And Ajahn Chah, who had this tremendously wonderful sense of humor and kind of very enormously perceptive and looking at people. And, and then he would tease people and laugh and everything was a, was a game for him. And of course, the Dalai Lama, there he is in the, you know, offering the Kala Chakra teachings, which is the wheel of time and the creation of time in the universe at Madison Square Garden for 5,000 people. And they make this big throne for the Dalai Lama that's, you know, um, covered with brocade and all the monks are chanting, oh, and then <laughs> clashing the cymbals and he comes in and there's all this fanfare and he walks up the steps to the top and they put a couple of mattresses up there so he'd be comfortable, covered them with this beautiful oriental carpet and he sat down and it bounced. <laughs> and then he smiled and he bounced again <laughs> and bounced really good and he smiled and he bounced some more. And so here he is giving like the highest Tibetan teachings on the creation of the cosmos out of nothing and the release from the world of time in Madison Square Garden, kind of sitting up there and bouncing like that. You know, and he carries he carries the weight of uh, the tragedies of Tibet. You know, the burning of the monasteries, the repression of the people and their language and culture over a half a century and his own, you know, family and responsibility and all that. But he also has this tremendous joy. It's an, and it's kind of an amazing thing. So I have a koan for you tonight, which we'll get to an answer of at, toward the end. Um, there's a professor at Harvard named Daniel Gilbert just published an article in Science Magazine, which is one of the kind of, um, how do you say, it's one of the most respected of all scientific journals on happiness. And he did this thing. He actually has an, has an iPhone app about happiness <laughs> where he got some thousands of people to sign up and then it would, it would beep them or tweet them or whatever it happened to do. And they would have to pause where they were and answer um, what they were doing at that moment, um, whether, they're, whether they were attentive to it or whether they were wandering, thinking about other things, um, whether they were happy or not on a little scale, you know, are you eating or walking or sleeping or, you know, driving or whatever, um, and, you know, whether it was pleasant or unpleasant, and what was the state of happiness. And he, uh, he got a quarter of a million responses from all this, and then he tried to sort out what is it that makes people report that they're happy. So that's the koan. What is it that makes people, what do they report that makes them happy? Hmm? I'll let you guess. Any, any guesses? Uh, other guesses? Love, presence, focus. Focus. Okay, we'll see. We'll see. We'll see. Okay. But the most important thing... Let me see, I'll read you a passage. Tonight I'm just going to kind of riff on this and we might do a little meditation at the end. This is from Rachel Carlson. She writes, A child's world is fresh, innocent, new, beautiful, full of wonder and excitement. It is our misfortune that for many of us that clear-eyed vision, that instinct for what is beautiful and awe-inspiring is dimmed as we grow older. If I had influence over the good fairy who blesses all children, I would ask her gift to each child in the world be this, a sense of wonder so indestructible that it would last through all the years of their life. It's kind of like Einstein talking about whoever has lost the sense of wonder and mystery is, is not really seeing this world. So I was up at my little writer's cottage, which I have in the in the woods here and stay some of the time. And there's a couple of owls that live in the trees up there. Um, and they'll hoot back and forth. And the other night they were starting to hoot. It was, hmm, I don't know, seven. It was just getting dark. And I walked outside. They were pretty loud, so they weren't that far away, although they're hard to see up in the trees. And and um, one of the owls hooted, and I, I answered it, you know. 
cuckoo, coo, or whatever. Maybe it was a little deeper tone, cuckoo, coo, coo, closer to that. And it answered me back. And I'd never had a conversation with an owl. This went on for like five or ten minutes. I'd pause for a while, it would get really quiet, and then I'd go, cuckoo, coo, and it would go, cuckoo, coo. And I was just standing there grinning. Oh, this is way cool. I'm talking to this owl. I didn't know what it was saying, but you know, it spoke a different language. But there is, a, there is a profound understanding when I describe my teachers or Aung San Suu Kyi. Here is the Buddhist text. He writes, says the Buddha, Live in joy, in love, even among those who hate. Live in joy, in health, even among the afflicted. Live in joy, in peace, even among the troubled. Look within Be still, free from fear and grasping. Know the sweet joy of living in the way. And this is a kind of instruction from the Buddha. Even among those who hate, live with joy and love. Even among those who are afflicted, live in joy and health. Or those who are troubled, live with peace. It's kind of amazing instruction. He doesn't say, those who are troubled, get troubled yourself, right? You know? Or those who are afflicted get afflicted yourself who are unhealthy or those who are hateful will join them. It's a, it's a deliberate instruction in happiness and it's based on a profound and fundamental understanding of Dharma which is that the heart can be free and happy in this human life even with the 10,000 joys and sorrows with the losses and grief the devastation of the environment, the the continuing racism and warfare and struggles that we have as humanity, even to treat one another decently. But even so, it's possible for the heart to be happy. And not only that, it's recommended. How's that? (laughs) You know, that's... So we'll talk about that. Is that okay? I mean, we have that kind of question. You know, and of course, for a lot of people, and it's quite natural... There is the sense that meditation is more about self-improvement, you know, like going to the gym or therapy or things. Those are okay. You know, you need that. But um, no matter, this is Florida Scott Maxwell, the author. She writes, no matter how old a mother is, she watches her middle-aged children for signs of improvement. (laughs) And it's very easy to make meditation into a kind of grim duty in which you're trying to, you know, you're not good and you're too judgmental. I shouldn't be so judgmental. I should stop being judgmental, you know. I hate that judgment, right, ever. And, you know, and you, uh, in which your personality or your body or some, there's something wrong with you. And if you meditate right, then you'll fix yourself. The kind of grim duty. Um, but there's a whole different way to approach spiritual practice and it doesn't mean maybe next week I'll talk about grief and compassion and tears and so forth because we need that too that they balance one another but it doesn't mean that we deny the suffering of life here is Aung San Suu Kyi or the Dalai Lama or Gosananda leading these peace marches and chanting loving kindness through a war zone it doesn't mean denial it means that there is a freedom in you to choose your spirit no matter what's happened. One of my mother's friends, they swim at the same pool in San Francisco, is a guy named Ron Jones, who's a coach, kind of a basketball coach. He was a high school basketball coach. And he took over the team at the San Francisco Center for the Specially Handicapped. At least that's what it was called when the time that he did it. Maybe it's now developmentally disabled or something. I don't know the language. But he intended to coach this team to some great victories. But when he got there on the first day, he found that there were just four players who came for the training, one who was a, in a wheelchair. Um, the initial impasse was broken when a six-foot-tall black woman came striding out of the men's bathroom and demanded to be included on the team, which he did. And he describes having to throw out his first lesson plan when he found that it took 45 minutes simply to get all five players lined up on one side of the court facing in the same direction. (laughs) But as he threw his plans away, the basketball team grew. 
They had practices that they got hot dogs and cheerleaders. And although at times they had seven or 12 people on the team, uh, you know, on the court, um, they play basketball. Sometimes they'd stop the game in the middle to play music and invite everyone down to dance on the court and then send them back up. And in the end, they became the only basketball team in history to win a game by over a million points. <laughs> When one of their members, who was also the scorekeeper, found so much joy in pressing the point button on the scoreboard that rings in baskets that by the end of the game they had 1.2 million baskets registered. Eduardo Galeano, the great Latin poet, writes, The church says the body is a sin. You've heard that story. Science says the body is a machine. The marketplace says the body is good business. The body says, I am a fiesta. (laughs) And so there's a way of approaching life, even with dukkha, the Buddha's word for the measure of suffering and sorrows that are part of life, that are woven in. There's a way of approaching this mystery of incarnation that is not just lost in the in the sorrows of life, but also sees the beauty, the joy, the mystery of it. And the practice of mudita, as maybe we'll do at the end a few minutes of it, is to invoke or bring into consciousness this spirit of joy and love that's yours, but also in the love and the joy of the happiness of others. And I like to start the mudita practice by having people visualize somebody they care about or whatever, visualize their best adventure as a young child. Because that's that spirit that you see that was born into everyone. Now, there's a problem, you know, when we approach the practice of joy, this innocence, this unquenchable spirit of a young child. And the problem could be named as Unworthiness, guilt, another word, doubt, comparing, confusion. Is it okay to have joy? Especially if you're a caring spiritual person. What about all those who suffer? Or what if you're a melancholy artist type? I mean, what will happen to your poetry, right? (laughs) And we are indeed loyal to our suffering. You know what I mean, don't you? So this is a poem I've read many times here, but it is one of the great poems of the last decade or so that I've ever come across. It's Jack Gilbert's poem called A Brief for the Defense for the Lawyers Among You. Um, And it's tough. He writes, and even if you've heard it, you can kind of contemplate it, sorrow everywhere, Slaughter everywhere. If babies are not starving someplace, they're starving somewhere else with flies in their nostrils. But we enjoy our lives as well because that's what the gods want. Otherwise, the mornings before lavender summer dawn would not be made so fine. And the orange Bengal tiger would not be fashioned so miraculously well. The poor women at the fountain are laughing together between the suffering they've known and the awfulness in their future, smiling and laughing while somebody in the village is very sick. If we deny our happiness, resist our satisfaction, we lessen the importance of their deprivation. We must risk delight We can do without pleasure-seeking, but not delight, not enjoyment. We must have the stubbornness to accept our gladness in the ruthless furnace of this world. To make injustice the only measure of our attention is to praise the devil. That's an amazing line. To make injustice the only measure of our attention is to praise the devil. If the locomotive of the Lord runs us down, we should give thanks that the end had magnitude. We must admit that there will be music despite everything. And that's a really powerful statement. 
um, because the people who are unhappy and the injustice and the things that we care about and, and want to tend and offer ourselves to, first of all, if we drown in it, we're not going to be very helpful to them. And secondly, if they were in our place, they too would want to be happy. As the Dalai Lama or as Gosananda would say, the point of spiritual practice is to free the heart and to, to find happiness. To make injustice the only measure of our attention is to praise the devil. If the locomotive of the Lord runs us down, we should give thanks the end had magnitude. We must admit there will be music despite everything. And many of you have seen this because I carry this picture when I teach of Vedran Smolovich, who was the cellist in Sarajevo, during the three years that Sarajevo was under mortar fire and siege and snipers and besieged during the Balkan War in the 90s. And he would take his cello, and he was in the National Symphony. This is him playing in the bombed-out National Library of Sarajevo, and sit out in the square in spite of the sniper fire, put a little folding chair and put on his tux and bring out the cello, and play music. We must admit there will be music despite everything so that the people of Sarajevo would not give up hope. So André Gide, the French philosopher, says, know that joy is rarer, more difficult, and more beautiful than sadness. Once you make this discovery, you must embrace joy as a moral obligation. How's that? Deborah Chamberlain Taylor, teacher here, good friend, was leading a group over in Oakland for a year. She led some women's groups over there. Um, And in this particular group, she described um, a woman who participated. It was a group of meditation and kind of inner practices and contemplation and women's work and so forth. And this woman had been born into a really difficult circumstance. She was born in a family. She didn't know her father. Her mother was uh, an addict. Um, She was raised by some other people. There was a lot of um, loss and tragedy around when she grew up. Um, Really, really difficult. She got pregnant when she was young and had kids and didn't know how to support them and um, all kinds of great difficulties. Um, but somehow she had a kind of spunk to her, and she managed not only to raise her kids, but to get herself educated, to go through community college, then to transfer and go to Cal, go to Berkeley, get herself a degree, become a uh, become a, an activist. And you know, it's Berkeley. She became a Oakland. She became a radical, and she was a radical feminist and a radically politicized and radically this and that and so forth. And she was successful at that in a really um, powerful way. And now she was in her late 40s. She'd raised a couple of kids. And at the end of the group, the last day, she said, you know, I've been through an awful lot. um, And I've learned somehow to find a strength in myself. And this group has helped. And I've been a, you know, a feminist and a politico and radical in all these ways. And now I'm going to do something really radical. I'm going to let myself be happy. So, unworthiness, doubt, guilt, is it okay to have joy? What about all those people that suffer? In Buddhist psychology, when you read the text about piti, which is the Pali word, priti it is in Sanskrit, there are 25 kinds of rapture. There's tingling rapture and thrilling rapture and rapture that has lights and rapture where your body dissolves into... Um, fireflies and, you know, and, and cold rapture. And there are all these different kinds, just, you know, and that's just rapture. That isn't the other kinds of joy and all these kinds of happiness. Um, and one of the things that's interesting is that when you sit and you get pretty quiet and collected in meditation, it doesn't take very much. If you smile a little bit, the rapture starts to come. You see those little half smiles on the Buddhas, um, Turns out that it does something. I mean, now they've measured it and, you know, you release a certain endorphins and things like that. But as you get contented and present, all these dimensions of happiness 
open up in you. But we're afraid the near enemy to mudita, or the different enemies, one is a kind of jealousy, especially the happiness of somebody else around. It's as if there isn't enough to go around. Well, if I'm happy, you know, or if they're happy, then how, can I be happy too? Is that okay? Or, or if they're really successful and happy, is there still enough for me? Or again, we get so identified either with our own trauma and the sufferings which we've all gone through or the sufferings of others that it seems disloyal to others to allow ourselves to be happy. You remember that story where Ramdas was asked about, you know, how, um, what his relationship was to being Jewish um, because he, as I was, he was bar mitzvahed and grew up in a Jewish family and you know, what do you think about the Jewish spiritual path? And he said, oh, there's a lot of good things in it, the Hasidic teachings and the Jewish mystical teachings of the Kabbalah and so forth. And he said, it's, you know, there's a lot of great stuff in it. And then he paused for a minute. He said, but, but I'm only Jewish on my parents' side, right? <laughs> Which is an extraordinary, I mean, he's a very witty guy. There was no question about that. But it's also an extraordinary thing to say because it means instead of being identified with, well, this is what happened to me. My parents were this way and I suffered in that. And you all did. You all suffered. I know as children. But anyway, um, (laughs) but that's only on your parents' side. That's not who you really are in the most fundamental way. And that's really what, what Ramdas was talking about. So instead of being loyal to your suffering. You need to tend it and heal it and honor it. But it doesn't have to, doesn't define the Dalai Lama. It didn't define Aung San Suu Kyi or Nelson Mandela or Maha Gosananda. And it needn't define you either. How's that? Save you a lot of therapy money. I mean, (laughs) no, therapy is good. I've worked as a therapist. It's helpful. But it's just, you know, you know what I'm saying. At some point it's like, okay, enough already. So in the Buddhist teachings, there are causes for happiness and joy. Things arise due to causes and conditions. Everything is conditioned or caused. Here are some of the gates to joy or happiness. First gate. Integrity. It's called sila, virtue. It's the sleep of the just. When you act, when you speak and act in ways that are in integrity with your conscience and care for others, you're happier. You know, I put it the other way sometimes. It's very hard to sleep after a day of stealing and killing. (laughs) It's also very hard to meditate after a day of stealing and killing. It just doesn't work very well, right? So, but there's something more than that. When you live with an integrity, when you don't harm through your words and your deeds, it brings a profound happiness. So Christian mystic story I read, Abbot, Abbot Anastasius, this Christian desert fathers, had a, had a Bible written on very fine parchment worth 18 gold pieces. And once a young brother came to visit and seeing the book made off with it. And the abbot found the next day that it was stolen and realized the brother had taken it, but he didn't inquire about it for fear that the brother would lie and add perjury to the theft. He was concerned. And the young brother went down to Alexandria to sell the book and took it to this market, and he asked 16 gold coins. And the buyer said, leave it with me, and I'll find out whether it's worth that much. And with that, the buyer took the book to the holy abbot and said, Father, look at this book, this beautiful engraved book, and tell me whether it's worth 16 gold coins. And he said, yes, um, it's a fine book. It's worth at least that much. So the buyer went back and the brother came in and said, here's your money. I showed the book to the abbot Anastasius. And he said, it's a beautiful book and worth at least 16 gold coins. And the brother said, is that all? He spoke. Nothing else? Well, no, said the buyer, not another word. Well, said the brother, then I've changed my mind. I don't want to sell this book. And he hastened back up to the monastery to see the abbot and begged him with tears to take it back. But the abbot would not accept it, saying, Go in peace, brother. Should you want this, I make a gift of it to you. 
And the brother began to weep and said, if you do not take it back, I will never have any peace and I need to stay with you. And after that, he dwelt with the holy abbot and became a monk and lived happily ever after or whatever. (laughs) You know, you can talk to the monks up here and find out whether that's true or not. But you get, you get the flavor from that story. I find it really beautiful and moving of what it means to live with that kind of integrity. It's like Aung San Suu Kyi coming out of prison. She, she said, I will not go. I am here. I will not leave. I will not back down. And I will not hate you. I'll love you, but I'm not going to go away. And that integrity, I will tell the truth and I will love you anyway is an amazing thing, and it's what brings tremendous happiness. Happiness also comes from generosity. Do you know a really generous person who isn't happy in some way? I'm serious, you know, because generosity is the, Donna, it's the, it's the sharing of the heart with others. Donations for the Haiti earthquake poured into the American Red Cross, but nothing stood out like the coins and crumpled dollar bills that spilled from one envelope. The gift, $14.64, came with a note from the pockets of homeless people at a downtown Baltimore shelter. This note read, We're worried about the people in Haiti. There is a sweetness and a happiness when we can offer ourselves, whether it's time or care or money or your devotion, to others, it makes you happy. Ralph Waldo Emerson, to laugh often and much, to win the respect of intelligent people and the affection of children, to to earn the appreciation of honest criticism and endure the betrayal of false friends and ideals, to appreciate beauty and find the best in others, to leave the world a bit better, whether by a healthy child a garden patch, a redeemed social condition, to know even one life has breathed easier because you have lived, this is to have succeeded. And it's really that spirit of generosity that makes joy. It's not that complicated. What are other gates to joy? Gratitude. Gratitude for what we have, gratitude for our life. You know, you get that phone call some of you have had from the doctor that says your tests are don't look so good. Um, you need to come in. We have to talk about this. I mean, ta- I started the talk talking about the polio, you know, and you think you have a diagnosis or someone you love does, and then it turns out not to be so. Or it's, you know, healed or cured. And you go, oh, my God, I have my life back, my life that I was complaining about and worried about and wretched in. And all of a sudden, it's pretty cool to be alive. Thank you. You know, it's like the Russian astronauts in the early Soyuz days went up to their first space station. And there was something that happened to their capsule. I remember this 20 years ago or so, but it, it, it became very dangerous. It wasn't clear whether they would get back to Earth or not. Um, and finally, they were able to kind of set off and come back. And I guess there was a problem with the oxygen or whatever it was. It was really scary. Um, they were somehow able to fix things and get in their capsule and come back down. And they landed in Kazakhstan. Um, they don't land in the ocean. They land on the, on the earth. And the capsule opened and they got out and they put their heads down and they just kissed the earth. And they said, oh, home, I'm so grateful just to be here, to be able to walk, to breathe this air, to be alive. So gratitude for all the things that you have in your life. And gratitude's an amazing thing because it's not... um, It's not dependent on what you have. It's really dependent on your heart. And even your troubles can be something, the measure of sorrows that you've been given, that you can find a kind of gratitude for, because there's so much mystery about even the difficulties and the suffering we have and where they lead us, which is so unknown. 
And sometimes it's through the hardest things that the heart learns, learns the most important lessons in life. So what does it mean to really be grateful? And what is it like when you're grateful in your life? And what does that do to your level of joy? I tend to read this next month, but I'm going to read it now. In the early 1930s, my father tells the story of his father, my grandfather's business, which had collapsed. Jobs were non-existent. The country was in a deep depression. His father said we had a tree for Christmas that year, but no presents. We simply couldn't afford them. On Christmas Eve, we all went to bed in pretty low spirits. Unbelievably, when we woke up Christmas morning, there was a mound of presents under the tree. We tried to control ourselves at breakfast, but rushed through the meal at record time, and then the fun began. My mother went first. We surrounded her in anticipation, and when she opened her package, we saw that she had been given an old shawl that she had misplaced several months earlier, only now it was stitched again and fixed. And my father got an old axe with a repaired handle. My sister got her old slippers. One of the boys got a newly washed and patched pair of jeans. I got a hat, the same hat I thought I'd left in a restaurant back in November. Each old cast-off came as a total surprise. Before long, we were laughing so hard we could barely pull the strings on the next package. But where had this largesse come from? It was my older brother, Morris. For several months, he had been secreting away old things that he knew we wouldn't miss. And then on Christmas Eve, after the rest of us had gone to bed, he quietly wrapped up the presents and placed them under the tree. We remember this as the finest Christmas we ever had. So gratitude for the very life you have, which an awful lot of people in this world would be so grateful to have. It's a a gateway to joy, a gateway to happiness. Trust is another. As uh, the poet Pablo Neruda wrote, you can pick all the flowers, but you can't stop the spring. And there's some way, or, or, or the third Zen ancestor who wrote that, um, how does the line go? To be enlightened is to be without anxiety about non-perfection. To be enlightened, to be free in the heart, is not to be anxious about the fact that the world isn't perfect. How's that? Not perfect according to your ideas about how it should be. When you can actually see the what Oscar Wilde called the tainted glory of humanity and the, the sorrows and the joys as a kind of necessary perfection. Um, when you're not trying to make it different somehow, this trust um, changes everything. And, you know, you've all been through so much. And in part, I think the fact that you're here should be enough evidence that the world approves of you in some fashion or other. <laughs> Seriously, I mean, you've made it. You know, just to be here, be alive in some way is, you know, is the victory. And trust, basically, the other thing about trust is that who knows what's going to happen tomorrow? Please raise your hand. (laughs) I mean, I'm serious. What's going to happen tomorrow? Does anybody have a clue? You you know, there's odds. You go to Las Vegas and place bets and make some money and lose a lot too, right? But... What's going to happen tomorrow? Nobody knows. And, and so we actually live in trust. We live held by the body that breathes itself and the universe that holds us and the mystery of incarnation. And it's quite trustworthy. This from Margaret Atwood. She writes, If you did know, if you knew what was going to, be, what was going to happen next, if you knew in advance the consequences of your own actions, you'd be doomed You'd be ruined. You'd be a stone. You'd never eat or drink or laugh or get out of bed in the morning. You'd certainly never love anyone ever again. You'd never dare to. You understand? It's called beginner's mind, don't know mind. Ajahn Chah, my teacher, called it mine. It's uncertain, isn't it? 
and to relax, he'd say, rest in uncertainty. It is uncertain. The wise accept uncertainty and enjoy the dance of life. Another gateway to, to joy. You know, when a butterfly makes a chrysalis, or when a caterpillar makes a chrysalis, rather, to, in order to molt and change into a butterfly, as most of you probably know, um, when the caterpillar's in there, it doesn't just sprout rings and kind of fly away. Actually, what it does, this amazing thing, is that it dissolves its structure. And in the liquid, in the chrysalis, all those cells kind of dissolve, and then it reassembles itself. But in that mix of all the cells that had made that caterpillar and are now kind of floating around looking at one another, there appear what biologists, and they appear by a million what biologists call imaginal cells. These are a new kind of cell that weren't in there that start to get born out of the other cells. And imaginal cells are the cells that reorganize all the energy and all the cells there. Sometimes the other cells are reluctant, but they pull them along because the imaginal cells can picture that they can fly, basically. They're the cells in there that know what it would feel like to float on wings in your garden. And those cells reassemble all the information in there and make a butterfly. I mean, how can you not trust? (laughs) Something really wild is going on that made your body, you know? And in the length of time that I recite this one sentence, 50,000 cells of your body have died and 50,000 new ones were born. It's taken care of itself, fortunately. You know, it's so mysterious. And so trust is really sensing that we're part of some greater stream of life. And it brings joy. What else brings joy? I've got to finish my list so we can do our little, finish the koan and our meditation. Mindfulness brings joy. Presence, as someone said. A little poem from uh, our new poet laureate W.S. Merwin, if I can find it, the National Poet Laureate. Little breath, breathe me gently, row me gently, for I am a river I am learning to cross. And somehow as we sit in meditation, we begin to tune in to the reality of the present. To have mindfulness means to actually be here, with this breath or this sadness or this joy or this excitement or this plan or memory and say, oh, that's a memory or a plan, that's joy, that's sadness. And to have the space of awareness of our own Buddha nature that says, yes, this too, without being frightened by it, or you get frightened and say, oh, this is fear, thank you, this is fear too, without being so attached and lost in it, oh, this is attachment, I notice that. In the space of awareness and presence, there is a gift of happiness that comes because you're not entangled in the world, you're free in it. And every moment of mindfulness, my teacher Buddha Dasa called it it everyday nirvana. was the release of, because you're caught in something and all of a sudden you wake up and you say, wow, I was really caught in that, wasn't I? And in that moment, oh yeah, here's the moment of freedom a certain moment of joy. And of course, we don't do this a lot. There was that story, and I I won't tell the whole thing, about Joshua Bell, the world-class violinist who the Washington Post sent down to play violin in the the metro station underground in the subway in Washington one morning with a $3.5 million Stradivarius violin and a hat. And almost nobody stopped. He was playing Bach, this amazing Bach piece on the Stradivarius, and people were in a hurry to get to work. The only people who really tried to stop were kids. And I think he got $17, you know, at the end of his hour of playing. Got 100000 the night before in the concert hall, but, you know, evens out. But what does it mean to be present for our life? So what Daniel Gilbert found out at Harvard, after getting 250000 
tweets and responses of where people were and what was pleasant, unpleasant, what made them happy, whether they were wandering. First of all, that, that at least half of the time people weren't there, that they were wandering, meandering, thinking about other things. But that the things that made them the happiest were... Uh, intercourse? <laughs> Sex. How's that? <laughs> got their attention, basically. Um, Walking and exercising, moving their bodies, dancing, and engaging in conversation on different kind of social intercourse. They were happy when they were present and when they were connected. And then in all these other things where their mind was scattered or not, there was a very clear gradient, and it didn't have so much to do with the particular activity that they were doing, but if they were really present, if they weren't wandering and distracted and so forth, if there was a sense of presence with that person or the activity or thing, that brought happiness. And where they weren't so mindful, where they weren't so present, didn't matter, even if it was a cool thing, they weren't happy. And so there's this great gift of mindfulness, of presence, that we train in meditation, that we learn as we develop, that allows us to be present for one another, for the mystery of this world, for the beauty that there is in it, and for the tenderness and for the sorrows that are in it. And that's the gateway. And the next gateway, which is the same, is the gateway of connection. Because you're present, then you are connected. So another story for you. Some years ago, a sunny Sunday afternoon in Seattle, a young Catholic priest stopped to talk to a parishioner and her five-year-old daughter, Carmen. The little girl had gotten a new jump rope, and the priest, who was still young enough to remember, began to demonstrate the intricacies of jumping rope for her. She was thrilled, and after a while, Carmen began to jump herself, first once, then twice. Mother and priest clapped loudly for her skill. Eventually, the little girl was able to jump quite well on her own and wandered off with her newfound skill in her jump rope. Priest and mother chatted for a while until Carmen, with sad, wise eyes, returned dragging her, hope, her, her rope. Mommy, she lamented, I can do it, but I need lots of clapping. <laughs> and we do. There's a way in which our happiness also... I mean, there is, in modern neuroscience, there are mirror neurons, or there's, they used to call it limbic resonance. When you have a violin in the corner of the room that's sitting there and somebody else plays the violin, that other violin strings will resonate. And in the same way, when there's mindfulness or joy or presence, um, we catch it from one another. It's contagious. And it's another gateway. Be around people that have joy. Be around people that help you also be present. Connection brings happiness. And then, of course, mystery brings happiness. This from Guillaume Apollinaire, who writes, Now and then, it's good to pause in your pursuit of happiness and just be happy. (laughs) Can you hear that? Just be happy. It's called happiness without a cause. And I like to tell the story. Um, I do it on my day longs, especially for new students when teaching eating meditation about Maurice Sendak, you know, the author of Where the Wild Things Are. Um, And he said he gets lots of children's letters all the time, and he tries to answer them all rather responsibly. He said, I'll send something back. But one day I got a little card from this boy, Jim, and it had this most wonderful drawing on it, and I loved it. So I wrote him back, and I wrote him a card, and I drew a picture of a wild thing on it, and I wrote, Dear Jim, I loved your card and your drawing. Several weeks later, he said, I got a letter from his mother back, and it said, Jim loved your card so much, he ate it. Sendak goes on, that to me was the highest compliment I've ever received. He didn't care that it was an original Maurice Sendak drawing worth so many thousands of dollars or anything. He saw it, he loved it, and he ate it. There is 
the happiness for for no cause is really the happiness of walking down the street and seeing the scudding clouds of you know the rainy season that's starting and the reflections and the puddles and smelling the bay leaves and looking at the leaves that have fallen that have these colors and seeing the eyes of the people going by and playing with your steps and dancing and and moving about and realizing that you know you're alive and you can be joyful and to meditate which allows you to quiet the mind and open the heart is a gateway to beginner's mind to presence as we talked about to gratitude to an openness and and to a shared and mysterious joy of this whole world because it is so mysterious you know nobody can explain it what's consciousness how did you get in there as a person you don't remember where are you going when you leave this body mm not sure huh very interesting what's love really you know all the big things that matter a lot are so mysterious and so beautiful as well as at times so painful love is love is both isn't it it has all of that in it and so somehow to appreciate that the world is shining with mystery it brings a kind of happiness and it's not the happiness of clinging or making or wanting to be or trying to improve yourself or or you know fighting with the world it's really the joy i think of the dalai lama of his interest and curiosity and love of gosananda of just being alive in itself when our second son jasper was born he was labeled a child with down's syndrome this is linguistically as inaccurate as it could be in jasper's case it should be labeled up syndrome <laughs> when he first wakes up he rushes into his parents bedroom and leaps on us with an enthusiastic happy to you morning he meets the entire world with his heart outstretched and he hugs everyone he can it's his favorite way of being they used to call his state retarded it does make me wonder other parents of similar children have warned us to curb his hugging behavior or he will be the target of molesters but this is jasper's gift how can we deny it the other day we were walking down the street and he got out in front of us he's almost 12 but he's very small and this angry looking tough guy with tattoos and piercings comes toward us and i go uh oh but it's too late to reach jasper and then i see jasper look up and smile and throw a big hug around this guy's legs and shout hi there and the tough guy paused and tousled jasper's hair and i could see this shy young boy smile come over the face with all the piercings jasper had done his magic again and this is mudita it's really the joy in the happiness of others